So I forgot to ask, uh, oh, are you going to control me or am I going to control myself? Okay.
Good morning, everyone. Welcome, 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 welcome. Um, that's what Jimmy Fallon says, isn't it? <laughs> We'd like to welcome you today to this place of worship. God is here. Do you believe that? Is God here? Wonderful. You are here. I am here. God is here. We rejoice together in God's presence. Today is the fourth Sunday of Advent. Wow, the time is flying fast. Fourth Sunday of Lent, not Advent. Time is flying fast, isn't it? Soon we will be at our Easter season. So today we again welcome you. Our uh, greeter today on YouTube is Jackie Vega. Thank you, Jackie, for doing that for us today. If you would like to follow along in a order of worship, you may get that online at valleyumc.org under current events. So uh, you can do that while you're doing nothing else. Aha. Uh -huh. I'd like to welcome our special speaker today, Reverend Ryan Russell. He's over here. Ryan is um, the associate pastor at Walnut Hills United Methodist Church in Urbandale, where he works primarily with the youth and kids program. Ryan grew up in Tacoma, Washington. He went to school in Idaho and at Garrett Evangelical Seminary in the Chicago area. And he just last week was approved to be ordained at annual conference this June. So congratulations are due, Ryan. So today, if you uh, can find your Lenten kit, you need your sea glass and the piece of wire that you were encouraged to gather, and also some objects from nature. And also, we'd like to invite you to join with us in worship and singing. And those of you here in the room, we uh, try to practice whisper singing. And I have tried that some, and it is kind of hard to do. But in one way, it kind of helps reinforce the words. You're thinking more of the words than the tune, perhaps. So welcome, Ryan. God bless you as you lead us today. Let us continue our Lenten season of recovery as we focus on health in all the ways that health is at the heart of our spiritual life. Not ignore the health of the planet that sustains us. We discovered that this week we are in a boat with the one who shows us our power to change things, to calm the storm. With his healing, we protect and restore the treasure that is our home. Vessels, holy and holy. Broken, needing the one open body and soul, healer come. Today we come to a time of our prayer of confession. Let us acknowledge our need to restore, repair, and renew the holy vessels that we are, especially this holy container of life 
in which we live this very planet. Let us pray. Life-giving God, in the beginning, you created this universe with the words, let it be. And the waters and dry land, the sky and the creatures were formed. You set humanity among these wonders and invited us to honor and care for all things. Seeing the abundance as a feast that would never end, we gorged ourselves, taking more than we could replenish at a rate that could not be sustained. We are witnesses to a world more broken than we inherited it. Water, wind, and wave, fire, drought, and earthquake, that signal it is a time for us to pay attention and to make real change. It all feels overwhelming, and so we look away, sometimes even from small things that we could do. Let us pray in silence. Vessels holy and holy, broken, needing the one, open, body and soul, healer come. I invite you to imagine a warmth arise within the core of your body. It may help to keep your eyes closed. This warm orb, globe of light, is deep within you. A flame always there and ready when it, you need it. The warm glow begins to emerge from your inner being. And it fills you with determination and courage. It floods your whole body until your skin is flowing with it, radiating outward. You feel strong. Know this. Jesus asks us to do hard things, to make changes, knowing we are capable, no matter what. We can change and heal this jewel, the planet we call home. The calm of Christ in the storm is available for me, for you, and for all. So take a deep breath in. Let this truth fill you. And breathe out with the relief of assurance that you are forgiven. Thanks be to God, we are a forgiven people. And now, as we pass the peace of Christ, I invite you to imagine the warmth that surrounds you, extending to those who may be nearby. Imagine that warmth extending beyond your walls to your neighborhood, to the wider community, to the whole church. And seeing it spread like the rising sun, let it extend to all the world. Let this be our peace. Amen. If you have not already, I invite you now to open your eyes. The peace of Christ 
be with you. Invite us to stand to sing this hymn. I sing the almighty power of God that makes the mountains rise, that spread the flowing seas abroad and built the lofty skies. I sing the wisdom that ordained the sun to rule the day. The moon shines full at God's command, and all the stars obey. I sing the goodness of the Lord, who filled the earth with food, who formed the creatures through the word, and then pronounced them good. Lord, how thy wonders are displayed where'er I turn my eye. If I survey the ground I tread or gaze upon the sky, there's not a plant or flower below that makes thy glories known. And clouds arise and tempests blow by order from thy throne. While all that borrows life from thee is ever in thy and everywhere that we can be, Thou, God, art present there. You may be seated. If you have children at home, I invite you to bring them around the computer a little bit closer. Today, uh, I, we would we'd ask that you would find some outdoor items for the children's moment, which I did not bring in anything into the sanctuary because it's all wet. But if you have some things at home that you can use, uh, feel free to grab those. But before we do anything else, let's breathe together. I'm not talking about inhaling or exhaling, but about true breathing. When we inhale, we take in oxygen, which our body needs. But when we breathe, but when we breathe, something else happens. In the Bible, we hear these words from Job. The Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. When we breathe, each breath is the Spirit. It's the breath of God Almighty in our lungs. Our bodies need oxygen, and our souls need the breath of God. Working to heal us from the inside out. So let us start by taking a deep breath in, slowly through your nose. Let that breath stay in your lungs for a couple of seconds. And now let it out slowly through your mouth. And let's do that one more time. In through your nose. and out through your mouth. So this past year has been very challenging. I know all of you here at least would admit that too. Just because we're people of faith doesn't mean that this global pandemic hasn't been a blessing because it, it could be one in disguise. It doesn't mean that you are a person of weak faith if you have had a hard time finding the silver lining in that this difficult year. And so even in the hard times, 
God is always with us, working to heal, working to restore. The word restore is special. It means to bring back something to its former condition. So during this past year, the earth has been ever so slowly healing. With fewer cars on the road, driving to and from work, the carbon emissions in the air have decreased. People are able to see, in some places in the country, not in Iowa, mountaintops again, because the smog that was around them has cleared. Having fewer boats in, in the harbors has allowed dolphins and whales to be able to swim in the areas that they haven't been able to be seen for decades. Less noise pollution means that crickets are chirping, frogs are croaking, and birds are singing. Nature is music that we can hear. And people, people have played outside more, gone on more bike rides, picnicked in the park, looked up at the stars more, remembering that we are not virtual, but living, breathing, laughing, loving parts of God's natural world. There is healing in all of that. So if you have some things from outside, I invite you to look at them and Think about how these pieces of nature are a part of creation and how these are perfect in God's sight. And I encourage you this week to find ways, if the snow doesn't come tomorrow, to reconnect with nature, to spend some time outside, to find something like a rock or a leaf or an acorn or a feather and take it into your, your room and place it on the windowsill or on your nightstand, some place that you'll be able to look at it throughout the week. In our breathing time, we focus on what it means to truly breathe. Oxygen feeds our bodies. The Holy Spirit feeds our souls. Nature breathes, too. The oxygen that we breathe comes from nature the plants, the trees, and even algae produce it. And when we breathe out the plants, the trees, and oxygen or an algae take in that carbon dioxide and turn it back into oxygen. God created this whole world so that we can take care of it. We can take care of the earth. The earth, because the earth takes care of us. To care and be cared for. It doesn't get much more healing than that. Let us pray together this morning and repeat after me. Loving God, we come to you with hearts, hands, minds, and our souls in your healing touch. Heal us from the inside out so that we may reach out to help heal your world. Amen. How the world has changed. It seems quickly, but actually it has not been quickly. It's been very, very slow over the centuries. Over the eons, the world changes. But somehow our realizations seem to come kind of suddenly when we see floods and hurricanes and tornadoes 
and all kinds of disasters that are not supposed to occur more than 100 years apart, but they are now 10 years apart or five years. It makes us think that these things are happening, happening suddenly. Here are some contemporary words to make you think. From Desmond Tutu, 25 years ago, people could be excused for not knowing much or doing much about climate change. Today, we have no excuse. Mahatmas Gandhi said this, a good reason, a good person is the friend of all living things. And then I would like to comment that we need to realize that all of life depends upon the choices that we make now. Suddenly, the onus is on us. You get that word play there? The onus is on us? <laughs> Bill, you get that, don't you? I'm not sure he does. Here's some final words of contemporary thought. We don't inherit the earth from our ancestors. We borrow it from our children. Something to think about. Our scripture lesson this morning comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 8, verses 18 to 27. <clears throat> now when Jesus saw great crowds around him, he gave orders to go over to the other side. A scribe then approached him and said, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Another of his disciples said to him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, Follow me, and let the dead bury their own dead. And when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. A windstorm arose on the sea, so great that the boat was beyond or being swamped by the waters. But he was asleep. And they went and woke him up saying, Lord, save us. We are perishing. And he said to them, why are you afraid, you of little faith? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the sea. And there was a dead calm. They were amazed, saying, what sort of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? The word of the God of God for the people of God. So thank you for having me this morning. Um, it's a privilege to be with you. Uh, I know at my church, our music director is also gone this week. So it's very interesting to see what will happen when I talk to them later today. Um, and I know Lee has uh, not had a Sunday off since she started here in July. And so it was very, uh, it was very nice and easy for us to, for her to have me come over. I live actually over here on four, between 39th and 40th um, on Dakota. So it's really close. And uh, we're doing the same sermon series. So it was really easy for me to step in and, uh, and be with you today because I'm familiar with all of the material already. So as you recall, over the last few weeks, we have been looking within ourselves and our community, hoping to find hope and healing to make us holy vessels once again. As we continue our Lenten journey, today we are going to think about what it means to have restoration in our lives. Restoration is the act of returning something to a former owner, place, or a condition. In Jeremiah 30, we find him saying, I will restore you to 
health and heal your wounds, declares the Lord. We find this sentiment throughout the Bible, the idea that God and Jesus are always restoring us and all of creation back to what, how God intended us and it to be. So today we are going to turn our attention to the cosmos, to our place within the whole of creation. This week we are reminded of the magnificent and raw power of the reign of God. The God who heals through a gentle touch is also the God who rebukes the wind and the waves. As we have seen over the past few weeks, Jesus has been a gentle healer who taught us to taught as he worked with the people in his community. This week's scripture gives us a new glimpse of what Jesus brings to us through his divine nature as both God and a human made flesh. Jesus isn't some protagonist that cares and heals, who just, sorry, just cares and heals, but he is a divine warrior and an agent of deliverance in the end, with his power extending over, not just over disease and disability, but even over all of creation itself. Everything that Jesus does needs to be thought of as how it connects to the cosmic drama of conflict that is transformed into restoration. We find Jesus on the side of the water with a crowd, and several of the people came up to him and said something. Jesus responded to each by to each, but turns their questions around on them. He poses a question as ha- of how important it is to follow him versus taking care of one's own things, like burying your father. And then the scribe comes up and says, I want to follow you fully. But Jesus really knew what was in his heart. And then Jesus got into the boat with his disciples. And I bet there were probably several other boats because, as the scripture said, there is a great crowd around him. And he told all of them to go to the other side of that water, a body of water. And as the boat was starting to cross the water, a great storm came. And the waves were crashing over the sides of the boat. And all of that, during that time, Jesus was asleep. I don't know about you all, but the way that those boats are made, um, when I was in Israel, we saw a historically old one that they found in mud called the Jesus boat. And they don't have a deck to go underneath. They don't have, they're just a rowboat basically that's big. And so in some of the translations of the Bible, you might see that Jesus is, goes down in, down under the boat. Well, That's not real. And so if you're asleep, you would be getting waves, all water, all over you the whole time. And I don't think I would be able to sleep in that rocking motion and that much water being poured over me. And that's what was happening, right? But on the other hand, Jesus was super exhausted from all of the work that he'd been doing. Even though it was a rough storm, His deep sleep was attained easily because of how much he trusted in God and in his own divinity. That he was even able to find peace and slept soundly in the midst of that crazy storm. The disciples were scared and they decided to wake Jesus up because they knew that he was going to be able to help them in some way since he was their leader and they fully trusted in him. When they woke him up, Jesus said to them, why are you afraid, you of little faith? Then Jesus got up and rebuked the wind and the waves. 
when I've been at the ocean, because I grew up in Washington State, and I could go to the ocean or even the waterfront where I lived, and that was like five minutes away to the waterfront. Um, and when I lived in Chicago, seminary was built right on Lake Michigan. And when a storm goes away, the water is not instantly calm. In fact, it might take a day or two, a day, several hours or the next day before it is calmed down. So the fact that Jesus rebuked the wind and the water and the storm was instantly gone and the sea was instantly calm is what we could consider one of Jesus' miracles. The disciples marveled at Jesus because this was the first time that they fully had realized the power that Jesus had within him. And how even the basic elements of the world obey him and heed every word that he speaks. At this point in Jesus' ministry, he had not really performed any miracles besides a couple of healings. His following of people came because of his teaching and preaching and the need for a healing or two that they had witnessed from before. He was progressively revealing his power to his disciples so that they could continually build trust in him and within themselves as followers of Jesus. In Jim Baumkapp's commentary on this scripture, he says, sometimes God calms the storm around God's children or God's child. And other times, God calms the storm with God's child. This teaches us the truth that sometimes God always, or God allows us to go through trials and storms. Yet in the midst of those times, we will look to God and trust in Christ when we have that peace that passes all comprehension. Today's scripture reading reminds us of the work of Following Jesus is costly. To follow Jesus, we must cross over land and seas. We must be willing to leave behind all that we know in order to grow and transform our task into a new thing. We all can acknowledge that when we do a new thing, it is usually hard, right? Or it can be. And for some people, it could even be a little bit scary. But for us to be the people that God is calling us to be, we must first press on, moving forward to do that new thing. We can find comfort in the knowledge that Jesus is with us in every step of that journey towards getting that thing done. For example... Uh, when I was in college and early, my early work history, um, I did uh, high ropes courses and outdoor education with, with kids. And so, um, and corporate groups and different things. And um, Microsoft would bring out to one of my the places I worked their, their teams. And we would be 60 feet up in the air on wires uh, with these people. And so, for, yes, obviously they may not have been Christian but they're finding some sort of strength in themselves to be able to overcome the fear of heights, right? And the fear of that, that thing, that new thing that they've experiencing that day. And so for me, when I first did that, I trusted the equipment, right? But I also trusted that God wouldn't put me in a place of danger on purpose, right? Like I knew that I would be okay in the end. So even in the midst of new things we might, that we might be doing, we acknowledge that there are a lot, there's a lot of brokenness in our lives that calls for healing, renewal, and restoration. Perhaps nothing is more important and more immediate than the healing, renewal, and restoration of the planet. The environmental health of our world impacts us more than we can even imagine. If we work towards recovery of ourselves, and our communities, but we fail to work towards the recovery of our environment. We find ourselves caught in a constant cycle of destruction. 
the healing of all of creation is intertwined and interdependent with us. God put humanity on earth to care for it, to have dominion over it. So ask yourself, how have we done with that? As I think back to my college years at the University of Idaho, I studied geology and in some of the classes, climate change. And I know that my understanding of climate change changed because the science was able to prove it to me. And not that I didn't believe it before, but I was able to really see the evidence through, through the science. So just to warn you, I'm going to give you a little science lesson. It, it, but, and for those of you who understand this stuff, this is very generalized, right? I can't say a lot in six to eight sentences. Plus, this is not a science lecture, so I don't want to get into it too much. But, um, but in the last thousand years, for example, of history, the, uh, the paleoclimate record shows that climate does vary because of solar and volcanic activity. And when those activities happen, more carbon is admitted into the, the atmosphere. When those events occur, that forces climate to change to, ha to happen, right? The climate changes because of that level of carbon. But when humanity in the early 1800s, or sorry, 1800s and early 1900s, um, began using engines that produce CO2, the CO2 levels in the atmosphere dramatically increased. And you can see this in ice cores that they've drilled out of Antarctica and bring back. And each layer of ice has little bubbles in it. And they can measure the carbon levels in those bubbles to be able to determine the concentration. And over the last 20 years, especially, they've seen the huge increase um, even over the last 100. And that carbon in the air, in the atmosphere, as you all know, creates a blanket over the Earth, an insulating blanket, which causes global warming. But because the atmosphere is more complex than that, we know that um, it not only creates warming in the world, but it also uh, makes it colder in places that usually and historically have been warmer places, like Texas last, the other week, right? For an example. So we have not always cared for the creation as we should, right? So how are we going to turn that should this ship around as a community, as a, as a global community? What new things can each of us do in our own lives? How can we follow the way of Jesus when it comes to environmental health? How can we create something beautiful that will last for generations to come? Let us as followers of Christ become a part of the positive tipping point that creates a world that creates the world that we need to survive that leaves a lasting impact for the generations to follow that follow. This task isn't one single person's job to take on. But when we all work together, we can change the world, right? When we heal what we have done to the earth and restore it to how God intended it to be. It just takes changing one thing in our lives at a time. And before long, you'll be surprised on how many things you're doing that are new to help the planet. So let us become the caretakers that we are called to be. And let us share how we have changed our lives. Because as we have learned from our scripture today, words are powerful and can create change when they are spoken. Let us remember that the words of Thunberg when she said, we can't just continue living as there is no tomorrow, because there is always a tomorrow. Amen.
invite us to join together in the song, The Spirit of the Living God, Fall Fresh on Me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Melt me, mold me, fill Let us pray together this morning. Healer of our every ill, especially our fractured creation, we come before you to make our petitions known. Hear our cries for healing of body, mind, and spirit. We know that already you are work, at work among us, showing us the way to recover from the toxicities and grief of our time. You remind us that you are in a boat with us through the difficult times. We give you thanks for this path of following you. Even when you call us to cross over from one way of life to another. We pray especially for those who are impacted most by dwelling resources. We pray, for, we pray that, you, that we will continue to learn and see and know how our actions affect others, not just ourselves. We give thanks for the wake-up calls that people are sounding, and we pray for the fortitude to move this journey forward alongside them. We give thanks for the courage of activists and educators who help us wake up to the storm and to see that we have it within our power if only we have the collective will to calm that storm, to restore the earth's wholeness. We ask for courage and encouragement to reevaluate how we as a church can join this effort now and into the future. And God, we ask you today to listen to those prayers in our hearts, for those people in our communities and in our families who need your healing touch. Let us continue our prayers with the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as 
we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We've come to the time of sharing, sharing our offerings. I want to mention that today is UMCOR Sunday. UMCOR is United Methodist Committee on Relief, uh, formerly one great hour of sharing. And the really, really neat thing about UMCOR is that when we give for something special, 100% of our dollars go toward that special need. And uh, because our, our apportionments take care of the oversight and the administration of the, of the organization, when we give for special needs, 100% of our dollars go to that need. So today we invite you to support UMCOR with your giving. Again, we invite you to give here in the room. Or if you uh, are not here in the room with us, you can go on the UMC valleyumc.org website and click on the link to share online. Let us now give our gifts to God, not only of money, but of our time and our gifts and our service and our witness. Let us give to our God. We have, a, we have a video for the UMCOR Sunday, I guess. Did you know when you donate to the UMCOR Sunday offering, you support long-term sustainable development, U.S. and international disaster relief, global migration, and global health. As followers of Jesus Christ, we are called to respond with extravagant grace. Through the United Methodist Committee on Relief, we are able to make a difference in the lives of communities and individuals whose lives have been upset by storms, wars, fires, displacement, and climate change. This offering underwrites UMCOR's cost of doing business, allowing UMCOR to keep the promise that 100% of any gift to a specific UMCOR project will go toward that project, not administrative costs. UMCOR specializes in solutions that help people become self-reliant. Help us be a source of help and hope for those in need. Your gift helps UMCOR stay until recovery is complete. Give in person, by mail, or online at umc.org slash ssgive. Uh, there is an offering basket at the doors that you where you may leave your offerings as you leave today. Now let us join in our prayer over the offering. All things of earth are holy. All things are one in you. This earth is filled with your beauty, God, charged with your love. We bring, we bring these, these gifts our gifts for thy for service, service, dear Savior. Receive, receive and bless, bless them for thy, thy kingdom's, kingdom's sake. sake. Amen. Amen. At this time, if you have your piece of wire and your piece of glass, we will have our do our ritual this week. Please find those if you have them. The words of Jesus we highlighted this week are follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. These words may seem harsh, and yet we hear Jesus' urgency. Now is the time to move, no matter how difficult. We cannot wait. We can face storms because we are a people led by the healer. This week, for our symbolic action, we are going to restore some beauty by highlighting and adding to the beauty of one of our glass pieces. You've received a thin piece of wire, which I've got here, and you are invited to wrap 
that, some of that wire around the piece of glass. This can become a pendant. It could be hung in the window or worn on a necklace. Let it be a reminder to you that we must take care. We must care for and contribute to rather than diminish the beauty of this earth. So take some time now and wrap your piece of craft wire around your glass. And I invite you to take a photo of that piece of glass with the wire on it and send it to the church's email or post it on the church's Facebook page. Later in the the season of Lent, uh, Lee will use these pictures for worship. invite you now to stand with me and and uh, sing with us the closing song. <clears throat> The Spirit sends us forth to serve. We go in Jesus' name to bring glad tidings to the poor, God's favor to proclaim. We now go with the hands of Christ to scatter joy like sea, and all our days to cherish life, to do the loving This week, the reaction of the crowd in the story is amazement. It's amazing how Jesus is connected to the cosmic forces of wind and wave. As scientists now try to teach us, all things are connected. We are a part and parcel of all creation, which means that our work of healing as individuals and as a church extend to contributing to the beauty and the healing of our environment. Now go with the confidence that we can face the storm with Jesus in the boat, recovering our depth of love for all and our joy of living in this world. May the words of Jesus ring in your ears, follow me. And may the Spirit hover, move, and deliver you and put a spring in your step. Amen. Vessels holy and broken, meeting the one. Oh.